And I think that the new Zoom recording in progress is so funny. It's it talks to you through your computer now. It really wants you to know that they are recording. Sure. Okay, so hello, beauty friends. I'm Meredith Roddy from Beetle on an Artistic Wire. And I am doing something a little bit different today. I have been flexing my new bead skill muscles. And I've been playing around with resin from my friends at Blue Moon Crafts. Now, we have a special guest here from Blue Moon as well. Stephanie is hanging out. I told her I would not put her on the spot, but I wanted to welcome her and thank you her so much for introducing me to UV resin and how fun it is. And according to the email that I just got from Michaels, they have just expanded their resin section. So it's a very timely project. And so what I did is I worked on a way to incorporate that resin into bead stringing and wire work. And the project that I came up with was this mermazing necklace. And this is what we are going to be making today. So there are a lot of steps to this project, a lot of, of materials that I used, but as always, you can substitute so many different things and so many different ways of making this. If you're not into mermaids, you can make something else for your wire form. If you are not into the wire work, you can try something different. And I'm going to talk a little bit um, and mention the different substitutions that we can make along the way. Now, Yvette from Beetle on an Artistic Wire is hanging out over in the chat. So if you have any questions at all about Beetalon or Artistic Wire products or any of the, um, the skills or any of the steps that I'm showing today, go ahead and put a little question there in the chat. I usually see them as they're going by, but if I miss it, uh, an important question, Yvette will go ahead and interrupt me and make sure that I attend to it. Similarly, hopefully Stephanie will be willing to answer any specific UV resin questions that I might not know the answers to. So just for everybody um, who um, may, this might be your first class with me, and I always love to know, have you taken a bunch of classes with me before I see some very familiar names scrolling by, or are you new? Um, please let me know so that I can welcome you, but also so that I can kind of speak a little bit um, to what, what the skill level is for people in the class. Um, Nate is our moderator today and he is putting up a ton of really good information. And the most important of piece of information is this class is being recorded. So if you are joining me live, welcome. And thank you so, so much for hanging out with me today. But if you're catching it on the replay, you will be watching on the Michaels YouTube channel. And this usually is available between 12 to 24 hours after class I'm sorry 24 to 48 hours after class and you can rewind and pause and go over the steps over and over again um yes so thank you as always everybody for joining me and I think it's time to take that overhead camera Nate and start talking about the different materials that we're going to need for class today so <clears throat> For those of you who um, are weren't able to see or are joining us a little bit late, this is what we're going to be making today. So the fun part for me, well, the whole project was really fun, but I loved making this mermaid tail. And today what we're going to do is we're going to be working with the 20 gauge artistic wire to make the form for this mermaid tail. We're going to make these little scales, which are little U shapes from out of, out of the same artistic wire. And then we are going to, we're going to add the resin. It's going to be an adventure for all of us. I'm a little nervous because Stephanie is here in watching as well, but I think that, I think I, I, I got it. I think I'll do her proud. So we're going to make this beautiful um, mermaid form using this, the blue and the green resin. And then we're going to, to create that, or we're going to turn that rather into a hanging pendant with a wrapped loop. You can see that wrapped loop right on top. And then 
what I did to create the strung portion of the design is I walked into my local Michaels and I just grabbed everything beachy that I could find from the wall. I found starfish. I found swimming fish. I found um, all these really fun underwater color palette beads here. And I also grabbed a tube of size eight seed beads from John Bead. And I just used my bead board and we're going to talk a little bit about how I, um, how I designed this and some of the steps that I went through using my bead board to create this design. But I just, I went with what felt right. Sometimes you just have to let the beads go where they want to go. And that's really what happened when I made this design. So if you have all the starfish and the fish and the shells and the everything, then you can recreate this necklace exactly. But if you have different beads that speak to you, that, that either have a beachy theme or a different theme, um, you can go ahead and feel free to use those as well. Um, so... We are going to be using, as I mentioned, the 20 gauge artistic wire. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why I chose this 20 gauge artistic wire once we get to the resin. Um, well, that, I'll, I'll smatter that in around. We're also going to need some 19 strand 0.018 bead stringing wire. And I went ahead and I strung half of the necklace that I have laid out here on my beading board. I find that in class, it's a lot less fun to watch me stringing <laughs> beads than it is to actually be doing the, um, to be doing the project. So I have half strung up here. Um, if you don't have 19 strand 018, Beading, bead stringing wire. Um, there are substitutions that you can make for this as well. And I highly recommend going back and checking out the um, five things you should never do while making beaded jewelry video on the Michaels YouTube channel because it goes over soup to nuts, everything that you need to know about bead stringing wire. But this is the one that I chose today. Um, you will also need <clears throat> um, crimp tubes. You will also need wire guardians. Where did I put my wire guardians? I put them over here. I keep my wire guardians in a little, a little ring over here, but you'll need some wire guardians. Um, and then let's see, what am I missing? Oh, of course, the findings variety pack, which um, if you are a, a long time viewer, you know that I reached for my, um, my findings variety pack all the time. And then of course, the normal tools that you usually need when you are doing any kind of crimping or wire work. You'll need um, a nipper tool, a crimper tool, chain nose pliers, flat nose pliers, and you'll see me bringing those in and out um, as we are as we are creating. So, uh, and just as an aside, I love when I teach my Michaels classes on days that I'm working on future Michaels classes, because what I am doing right now is planning our September tools instructional class. So at, in that class in September, you, I will be talking all about pliers, all of the different beetle on pliers that are available in Michaels and what you use them for. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is one of the pliers that I'm using right now. This is the nylon jaw pliers. It's a flat nose or a chain nose plier. And these are, this white part is nylon. And I always reach for that when I am using wire because before I do any wire work, I like to just run them over the, the length of the wire to straighten it out, to get any kinks that might be in there out. Um, and just to, um, to, to prepare my wire to be worked. So the first instruction for, um, for our mermazing necklace today is to use the 20, 20 gauge wire to, you, to create a mermaid tail form. And I'm gonna put this guy right here just as a point of reference. And you can see this one over here is the one I just kind of played around with this morning. 
as I was making sure that I had all of the steps in place in order to make our project today. So I'm going to pull out about, let's see, let's get my little measuring tape down here. I'm gonna pull out about 14 inches. Usually I will work from the spool of wire, but I think in our class today, it's going to be easier for me to show without you having the spool in the way. And I'm using my nippers just to cut that off. So I have about 14 inches of wire and I have used my nylon jaw pliers to make it nice and straight. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so really, I just freeformed this mermaid tail. I looked at a line drawing um, to kind of get in, in, my, in my head the shape that I wanted to be. But you can just kind of see my process. What I'm going to do is start at one, one fin. And I'm going to use my chain nose pliers to bend about, let's see, that's about six inches from the end. And I'm using way more wire than I need um, because it's just easier to use more wire and cut it off because you can't really add any wire in this, in this process. So bear with me for one second, friends. I'm just gonna move my bead board off to the side so it is not quite so distracting. I was joking with um, Nate, the moderator before class, I have so going on <laughs> on my desk right now. And there, it's only a matter of time before everything falls. So I'm hoping that that does not happen. So I am just kind of looking at my example and using my fingers to bend around that one part of the fin. And now I'm going to come back here and use again, my chain nose pliers and bend it back. And maybe that is a little bit of a longer fin. Maybe it's a little bit of a shorter fin. But what I like about this project is it's so free form. If instead of a mermaid fin, I wanna do a cat or I wanna do a dog or I wanna do a flower, um, just with a couple of bends of this wire, trying to do it so that we can all see together, you can make a really fun form to fill with the resin. And there are so many amazing pre-planned, pre pre-everything forms and molds out there. But of course, because we we make wire and we sell wire at Beetalon and Artistic Wire. I wanted to do a project that was um, that was that I could use the resin, but I could also use some wire. So that is what I decided to do. Now you can see here, and I a little bit um, I did this on intentionally. I have a couple bends here that I don't want. Okay, so all we need to do is again, take those nylon jaw pliers and just straighten them out. If there's a bend someplace that I don't want, I can just smooth it out and then go back. And again, I'm just, I'm using my fingers. I'm using small incremental movements. If you, if you want, you could actually print out a, um, a picture or a photo or a line drawing or a vector drawing or um, any kind of drawing, <laughs> or you could even draw that freehand and then, um, and then work it like that. But this, this works for me. And so that is how I'm showing it. I'm also doing this a little bit bigger than I necessarily would if I were doing a piece so that not only can I see a little bit better while I'm teaching, but you too can also see a little bit better while I'm teaching. And if I want it to be a fish, I can make this a little bit fatter, right? And make it more of a fishy shape, but I'm going to stick with my, with my mermaid tail. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is up at the top, I'm going to bend one of these wires straight up and one of them out at a 90 degree angle. So let me just show you what I did there. Move my thumbs out of the way. So one wire is straight up and one is out at a 90 degree angle. 
And what I am going to do now is I'm going to wrap this wire that's coming out at the 90 degree angle around, right? So basically I'm making a wrapped loop. Um, and you can hold this with your nylon jaw pliers, if that's easier. You can hold it with your chain nose pliers. Um, but for this, really all I do, because this wire is gonna kind of wanna wiggle around and move around on me, but I'm gonna show that wire who's boss. So I'm just gonna come around here and wrap this two times. Is this the best wire wrap I've ever done? No, but it is good enough. I'm just gonna come in here and squish this up. And the fun thing about wire wraps is that oftentimes you can take a wire wrap that was not necessarily the best one you've ever done and fix it. So now my wire wrap is nice and even and straight. And I'm just gonna come here and I'm going to snip off that long, that long tail and then come in here and just tuck that little end in. I think that the difference between really good wire wraps and wire wraps that are just okay is coming in and taking the time and attention to tuck that little tail in. Okay, so now I have my form and if I have to go back and kind of make it look a little more mermaidy, like this part is a little, it's a little straight. Maybe pinch it in a little bit more so it looks more tail-like, but that's the thing about using this 20 gauge wire is it is the perfect sweet spot of bendability and stiffness. And it's also going to be thick enough to create a, a barrier for the resin once we start pouring the resin. Because you'll see that even though UV resin um, cre or, um, cures very quickly and, um, and efficiently, you still don't want your resin oozing out as it is curing. So it's a couple things to, to keep in mind um, that I have been learning on my newfound resin journey. All right. So I think we are in good shape there. Now, the next thing I wanna do before we get to, we get to resin, resonating, <laughs> resining. <laughs> How do we say it, Stephanie? Before we get to resining, I'm gonna put that over on my work surface. And the next thing that we need to do for our project is to make the scales. And I, I played around with a couple of different, um, different options for scales and in fact I even did one that had can you see what what I used here it's a little tough to see but I did it with all wire guardians I just wanted to see what would happen and I ended up not liking the way that the wire guardians looked as much um, but it was really fun placing each of those wire guardians and it was just kind of an experiment that I did also to show but I really like um, kind of the organic and um, uh, non-uniform nature of these scales. And so the way that I made the scales is I used, and in fact, we can even use this little scrap right here. Any scraps that you have laying around will work. And then I use my, um, my bail making pliers. I'm sorry, my, my stepped bail making pliers. Let's make sure we get the right words. So when you're looking for them, you know. I use my stepped bail making pliers. And if you don't have these guys, no worries. Just go ahead and use your round nose pliers. But I like the stepped bail making pliers for doing this. Um, they just, they have a nice, a, a nice feel. And oftentimes, and what I will talk about a lot in our tools slash pliers class is how tools feel in your hand. And this is, this is the, the tool that I think feels the best for doing this technique. Now I'm going to show this a couple of times at a couple of different angles because that first one was not so good. So I just used the second to the smallest and turned up a little U. And I'm going to do that over and over and over again. Lucky for you, I made a whole bunch. <laughs> so I do not need to do it over and over again. Uh, in class today, but let's see if we can get a really nice angle. I'm going to bump, bump my camera up just a little bit so I can get my hands in here. And I'm leaving about 
a, I don't know, a quarter of an inch or so here at this end. Let's, I was like challenging my camera to see how close can I get and still have a nice bit of focus here. And then all I'm, all I'm doing is rotating my wrist. I'm not even, um, I'm not bending the wire around. I'm letting the tool do the work. I'm just kind of moving my wrist like this to get that nice U shape. And then I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to snip. And I don't even worry about making each of these exactly the same because as we get to where we need to fill in, you'll see that having different shapes is very helpful. What is not helpful though, is if they are not perfectly flat. So a good way to flatten out the rings or the scales is to put them in between the jaws of those nylon pliers and just give them a little smush. Okay. So I have a, a good amount over there, but let me just show that one more time. And then we, I think we might be ready to move on to, I, pro, I procrastinated long enough. I got to get to the resin now. So once again, about a quarter of an inch, um, I always err on the side of um, having more waste wire because wire is not super expensive and it is easier to snip wire off than to add wire. And it oftentimes becomes more wasteful if you don't use enough wire in the first place. Okay, so now I have all of my little U's <clears throat> and it's time to switch over to my resin board. So I don't know if, um, and I would love to know from everyone participating, what what you what you put all your, your resin stuff in if you are a, a seasoned resonator <laughs> um what what do you use to kind of keep everything together um for my beading I always use these trays here um they're just cookie trays that I have mats on but I seem to have put everything in the beginning on my, um, on this board that I have. And now that's what I'm using to move all of my resin, resin supplies around in. Very strange. Okay, so for resin, <coughs> and again, um, uh, Stephanie from Blue Moon Studio is here in the chat. So if you have um, any specific questions, I'm going to do my very best to honor the spirit <laughs> of all of the resin, but this is not a Beetle on product. This is a Blue Moon Studio product. So I'm using it in conjunction with the Beetle on products. And that's one of the things that I love about teaching these classes that we're doing for the Michaels Community Classroom is um, the ability to use all of the different supplies that are in Michaels with Beetle on and Artistic Wire products. It's just, it's been a blast for me. So this is what I'm using. This is the, um, the the resin and it is a uv resin which means that it cures with this guy right here um it's a uv light i don't know if i should show like put that into the camera but you can you'll be able to see also um kind of like if you do acrylic nails um you you know what a uv light is it also works really well in sunlight but the best part in my opinion about the uv resin versus the two part resins that you you can sometimes see out there um, in the craft marketplace is it it's it cures in minutes so you don't have to worry about an overnight or um you know any any special extra things you just put it right here under this little uv um, light and it cures because one of the challenges that I was having when I was making um, pieces with different types of resin is it would ooze out and you'll see what I mean in just one second um, and so with the UV resin it cures almost instantaneously so it um, for a project like this it's it's a, a really good technique so the other thing that I learned <laughs> in my resin journey is that this resin tape is a special tape so I watched a whole bunch of videos where people were using packing tape or um, 
a, a washi tape or a different kind of tape. But what happens under the light is the tape actually heats up. And so this is a special tape. I don't know exactly the special properties of it, but this is a special tape so that it doesn't stick. Um, it has a, a good release, I should say, from the, um, from the piece after you're using it. And of course, the reason why I need this piece of tape, and I always like to um, put one corner up. It allows me to just kind of use my nail here. Just a little bit. It allows me to use my nail to hold that tape down without it always <laughs> coming up. Um, it's a little things that I've learned. Okay, now challenge. We have this little, this little um, wrap here, and I need this piece to be as flat as possible because, well, just because, <laughs> because I don't want my resin oozing out. I want everything to be even. I want, um, I want the, the, um, I want everything to be flat and even. That's what I'm trying to say. So I'm just giving this a little, a little tip up so that I can get this wire as flat as possible. So now all I need to do is take it down. <laughs> this is not my most graceful part of the process, but it's what we need to do. And not only does it, do I need to stick it down, but I need to also lift it up, Let's lift it up in the camera to again, make sure that everything is flat. The flatter you can get this wire as you are doing it, the better off you will be when you are making your, um, making your piece. And sometimes you need to do a little bendies and I might come back once I have my, um, to have my um, scales in there. Um, Okay, so Stephanie has chimed in. It is a special low tack polyester tape made for working with resin. See, teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> like it's just, it's a special tape that you should use. Just trust me, use it. All right, so hopefully, fingers crossed, I have made enough scales and I am going to bop my camera back up a little bit so I don't bump it as I am putting my scales in. And you can see I'm getting everything ready before I'm even pouring my resin, before I'm mixing my resin, before I'm even thinking about my resin for two reasons. One, because I'm totally procrastinating and um, putting off doing that resin. But also I like getting everything prepared so that when I do my resin, I can just concentrate on doing the resin. I think that one of the challenges to, well, at least for me, one of my challenges, especially when I'm learning a new technique is um, making it as easy and enjoyable as possible. And so for me, getting everything ready so that I can really concentrate on the um, on the resin and the pouring of the resin makes it a lot easier for me to kind of get through this. <laughs> and hopefully my my um, me learning will also help you. All right, let me focus now on getting these little these little guys in. Okay. So because the tape is sticky, it is good because it's going to hold everything in place. But because the tape is sticky, it also is a little bit of a challenge, which is why having this corner folded up is so good. But what I have noticed is in folding up that corner, I actually didn't, I wasn't paying quite as good attention as I should have. And this is going to be a little bit of a challenge down here, but I think I can, I think I can work a work around that. So now I am just going to try to make sure that we can all see together to add these. And you can see I'm using my tool to, to push these down too. I'm just using my, um, my chain nose pliers here. 
Um, I found that those, those are the best ones for this job. And actually what I'm gonna do is I'm going to fold that over and that will really help. So we're just going to make some skills. And you can see that having some of the skills, different lengths, when the, my, the part on the left is a little bit shorter because then it can kind of get into that crook a little bit more. And once you kind of get into the groove of this, it goes a little bit faster. So let me see if I can get this done. And let's see. So you could even, and one of the things that I was thinking about as I was putting my little scales together is doing them all as one piece. So instead of doing them, oh my goodness, come on, little guy. Let's work with me, not against me. Um, one of the things I was thinking is instead of cutting all of these little U's separately, Maybe I could do kind of a, a do, 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 like W's all the way down. <laughs> um, but then I thought, you know, it's not exactly the look that I wanted for this project because there would be, it, it, it would be more wire, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know. I might play around with that a little bit. Um, it, I was just so excited to be able to, um, to make a mermaid tail, to make it mermazing. And it's actually, if we wanna, if we wanna take it, if we wanna get real for a second, it's actually mermazing. And I am Mare, that is my, my nickname. Everyone calls me Mare. And so um, I, have, I have adopted the Mare in the mer <laughs> for me. Okay, so we're just gonna keep on going with these little scales. And I'm not, I, I, I think that the more um, asymmetrical you make it, the better. And I just wanna show also, this one was a little, a little wider than I wanted to. So I'm just coming in here and I'm, I'm squeezing the ends together to make it a little smaller. And that is helpful once you get to these sides because you'll have to kind of judge it a little bit and figure out um, which ones you wanna be bigger, which ones you wanna be smaller. Um, if instead of like me, you're, you decide not to work from left to right, if you're working from the middle out, um, you, might, you might need to judge things at the sides a little bit, but I just, and see how the, those first couple were a little bit, a little bit funky. I was kind of having a little bit of trouble getting everybody to cooperate. But the more you have in here, the more everything starts coming together. It's one of those projects that in the beginning, it's like, oh, everything is a little bit out of control, but then everything starts coming together. And I felt that a little bit with resin in general, um, is that there's there's a lot of, of um, in the beginning for me, there was a lot of, oh my gosh, am I doing this right? Is it, is it going to work the way I want it to? Um, but then everything kind of comes together, which is nice. I like a, a project like that where everything comes together. All right, let's see. And a couple of these are a little longer than I want them to be. So I'm just going to come in here and trim them down. Or maybe you want your scales to be longer. That's okay too. Um, it's really, it's such a, a, a do what you want project. There are a couple of, of guidelines, but then after that, it's just have fun. Okay, so I'm coming down here. I'm coming down the home stretch with my little, my little scale friends. And once again, I'm just gonna put my example up here so you can see where we're, where we're going. And you can see how much bigger I'm working, um, just to be able to make sure we can all see. And sometimes our scales run away from us. And so now I'm, I've done the scales as much as I'm gonna do. 
Um, and so now what I want to do is I want to come in here and just make sure that everything is nice and stuck down. Um, I'm actually going to pick this up. And now I have a couple of different places to pick it up, which is good. Just kind of make sure that everything is stuck down. And I'm not sure what we're going to do when we get down there, but we'll figure it out. And just to kind of do, do a, a double check and make sure that um, that we're ready for our next step. Okay, deep breath. Um, so there's a, a nice um, suggestion here in the in the group chat here for those of us who are watching our class live, which is taping the tape down would help. And it, it would, my challenge with taping the tape down, I guess you could use a double-sided tape to tape it down is with this tape, when you, once you roll it over, things become kind of wonky and out of, out of, um, out of plane. And you really want this as flat as you can get it for our next step. So if you had a piece of double-sided tape, that would be a really good, um, a good suggestion for the next, for, for how to, to keep it down so that it isn't moving all over if that's a challenge that you're having. Okay, so now I need to make two colors. I'm going to make a blue and I'm going to make a green. So I have some blue resin from my UV resin tint pack here. And it says shake well before, before using. So I'm just going to take that off of the camera and give that a good, good shake. Um, and there are, there are some, some safety concerns um, when you are working with resin. It is, um, and, and especially with the resin tints. And I'm gonna take yellow out as well because um, yellow and blue make green. <laughs> so I'm gonna make a little green as well. Um, and um, my, my, um, my suggestion is to make sure that you um, read the instructions before you use any of these resin projects or products. I also recommend going back onto the uh, Michael's YouTube channel and checking out all of the past videos and classes that Stephanie from Blue Moon Studio has taught, as well as make sure that you sign up for any upcoming classes as well. So you can learn soup to nuts, everything that you need to know about resin. So for today, you are going to see how I use resin, <laughs> which um, full disclaimer may or may not be the right way to use resin. We're just gonna, we're just gonna, um, we're just gonna leave it at that. <laughs> this is how Meredith does it. Um, maybe don't try this at home, friends, um, but this is how I do it. So I need two different colors. So I'm just putting some out in these little pour cups that I have. And one of the things that I learned is a little dye goes a very, very long way. <laughs> so um, one of the challenges that I have found with resin is that the more stuff that you put in there, um, the longer it takes to cure. Because if you think about it, it's very logical, right? You're, you're curing the resin and the more things that are in here, that UV light is being blocked. So the less you can block that UV light, the quicker your pieces will cure. That make, makes, makes good sense. And the more dye that you put in, the less, well, you can see right here, the less light that will flow through. So that blue, because it's nice and transparent, will cure much faster than that green because it's very opaque. Um, Finn is here with me, but he is in the other room. And I have not noticed that there is that much, um, that much, that fuming or off-gassing with the resin products. So I am just putting in the smallest, not even one drop. And I'm just kind of letting it come out of the dropper without even barely 
using it. So you can see that these droppers will go a very, very long way when you're not even using one full dropper full when you are doing your tints. I also tend to be a very messy crafter. So apologies if um, I already have resin all, or tints on my hands. Like I said, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> when you wanna learn the actual way of using resin, not the Meredith way of using resin, go with the vendor. All right, so I'm gonna come in here because yellow and blue make green and I'm just gonna use, oh, you know what? This is brand new right out of the pack. So I need to give it a little snippy snip to get that flowing. And again, just like the littlest bit, I hope everybody can see that. I'm sorry, I had that down on my, on my mat, but these little, little drops right there is all I put in, okay? And now I'm gonna come in here with a little mixing stick. I gotta remember where my camera is too. And I'm just gonna mix that up. So you can already see how much that little bit of tint and much like kind of the opposite actually with wire you can always add more <laughs> but it is very hard to add less so I think that I don't know I kind of like the opacity opacity of that and you can see when I put it down on my wood surface it's also nice and I like that color, it's good. Okay, so now I'm gonna mix up the blue. And the great thing, especially because I'm down in my studio and there's really, there's a little bit of natural light that's coming through, but not very much at all. So this resin won't cure until I hit it with that UV light. So it also has a pretty long working time. I don't know about you guys, if you, play around with different kinds of resin. Um, but I always get really, um, <laughs> really anxious that it's gonna cure before I'm ready. But this has a really nice long, um, long time that you can work with it. Okay, so now I'm back here and you can see, hopefully you can understand why using the 20 gauge artistic wire is so important for this project because if I use something thinner, if I use like a 22 gauge or a 24 gauge, let's see if we can see here, it's not going to give us enough plane to be able to hold that resin in. It's just going to go right over the edge and not hold it, not hold the resin in. Um, 18 gauge would be a great gauge to use as well. Um, I didn't use 18 gauge. I could have, and that, that would be a good, um, if you're struggling with the 20 gauge, 18 gauge would probably be a really good one to go with. And so now, okay. So for me, <laughs> this is how I, I need to have everything all together. So I have my, my UV curing lamp right here and I have my little resin guys right here. And so now all I'm gonna do is work and alternate the green with the blue all the way down. And after each section I do, I'm gonna cure it. Because, um, and again, kind of, you gotta work with, work with what, what your materials are and your, your, um, what your, yeah, your materials are going to allow you to do. So I, my biggest fear is I don't want anything to spill over. So I'm actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna cure that because I can already see I did it a little messy. And what you can't see, actually, I thought I can let you see what's happening here. Let's take this down and around and see what's happening on the inside. So that UV light is coming, um, is coming down <laughs> and curing that little teeny tiny bit of resin. And I believe it is a one minute timer. And once that goes off, then 
I'm just double checking to make sure that my ot light is not a UV light. <laughs> Um, because Stephanie, for those of you who are not here um, from Blue Moon, made a very good point, which is make sure that those little those little UV cups that you're using to mix everything in. I have a tendency to keep them, especially when you're teaching, you need to keep everything all together. But you want to make sure that the UV light isn't near them because they're going to cure. And that's you don't don't want that. So one of the things that I have learned um, actually from Stephanie from Blue Moon is that a better technique than um, pouring for something like this is to pick the resin up with your, with a, a tool of some sort, a stick, um, probably a little, a little metal or plastic stick is going to be best. And just pick up a little bit and drop it in especially for something like this, where you don't want that, um, where you don't want the resin filling out. Um, you wanna make sure that, I keep losing my train of thought, looking at all of these good suggestions that are coming in on the, uh, on the chat. Um, you don't want the resin to be spilling out. So I probably, um, I probably err on the side of, of too much curing. Um, I'm just gonna show probably one or two more and then we're going to move on to the finishing of the project because we don't need to see the entirety of all of this. All right, the, the most exciting part of the resin is waiting for the resin to dry. <laughs> that is the opposite of what is true. Um, but it's a it's an integral part, and I actually I like it because it um, it forces me to slow down and to think about what my next step is. I don't know about you all, but sometimes when I am working on a beading project, um, I get in the zone. But sometimes that zone is it prevents me from really paying attention to what I should be doing. So kind of being forced to stop every so often and check in on my project, make sure that everything is going where I want it to be is actually very helpful. Um, I tend to sometimes um, I can rush through a project and it's nicer to be able to take a moment, enjoy the process, um, because that's always my favorite part of, of beating and of learning new skills is enjoying the process. So again, I'm just using the smallest, smallest amount of this resin um, and making sure that it doesn't spill over. That was one of the biggest challenges that I had in when I started learning how to do the resin is making sure that things didn't spill over, um, which is why I realized that the 20 gauge wire is a really good sweet spot for making shapes like this, but also slow and steady wins the resin race. <laughs> that is my biggest takeaway from my journey, learning all of the, all of the techniques for the resin. Um, also making sure that you don't mix colors. I have a tendency to, um, to just grab whatever tool is, um, is next to me when I am working. I'm just going to speed up a little bit. And so you want to make sure that uh, when you're working with resin, that you keep a dedicated tool for pulling the colors out of out of the little cups. But I love finding a product that works so well with our beetle on wires. And this is definitely a fun rabbit hole that I have been going down over the past couple of weeks. Um, and those of you who know me know that I love learning a new 
craft <laughs> and love learning a new way of um, incorporating beetle on product um, into craft making. So this has been a great, a great journey for me. And I, I definitely thank, um, thanks Stephanie for all of her videos that I watched and learned from. And baby wipes are, um, as Kristen is, is chiming in, are a great idea to have here on hand. I usually have wet paper towels around here as well, um, but I don't today. So I'm just gonna be a little sticky. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So you can see here that all I would do is just keep alternating the blues and the greens all the way down and then fill this up here at the end um, in order to create the pendant. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set this one aside and finish that up after class and talk about in the, the last couple of minutes of class, talk about how to turn this um, beautiful resin sculpture, <laughs> this resin piece into a pendant and into a necklace. So what I did, and if you remember in the very beginning, I mentioned to leave a nice long tail up here at the top of our, um, our wrapped loop. Um, and here you can really do whatever you want. Let me go ahead. I'm just going to move my resin board <laughs> out. I truly feel like I'm on a cooking show today. Got all kinds of things. Oh, there we go. Something went overboard. I think it was some, some dye went overboard, but that's okay. Caps are on. Always, always make sure to keep your caps on. Okay. So let's move this back into place. Now this is, is typical of what my beading surfaces generally look like. <laughs> Not so great for being able to show stuff though. So let me, let me move some of these things out of the way. But this is why working on a beadboard is so great because I have all of these different compartments for all of my different pieces and parts that I'm working on. Um, and I had laid out here on this side, the second side of my necklace that I wanted to string up over here. And the way that I did this, just as a very quick little aside, as, I'm, as I put everything back as, as I wanted it, what I did is I, I added a silver piece in between, kind of at, at each of the, the numbers, and then I filled in the beads around it. So that's one of the ways that I like to use a beadboard to design is for patterns. So I know, knew that I had a specific number or a specific quantity of each of the silver beads. And so what I did is I laid each of the silver beads out in the pattern that I wanted it to be. And then I moved, then I came in with the, um, see these are six millimeter glass rainbow green rounds. I put those around each of them. And then I came in with the seed beads around each of those. So I like using a lot of repeating but alternating patterns um, when I do a beaded design like this. Um, and this one is a little bit different than the original one that I had. But I find that especially if I'm doing a repeating pattern that isn't quite 100% um, symmetrical, or if I'm changing some of those repeats, it is very helpful to lay that out on a bead board and put each bead down in, into each of the places. So um, for, the, for the, the pendant, turning the resin piece into a pendant, um, what I want to do first, and you can do this in so many different ways, but I'm going to put on my shell bead right? Because isn't that, doesn't that make you think of a mermaid? You could use one of these starfish as well, but I just, I love, 
I love the, these shells. I had so much fun um, picking them out when I was in Michael's and I didn't have the project in my mind when I picked them all out. I just knew that I wanted to do something that was very beachy. And um, then the, the mermaid um, tail kind of came out of that. And from this um, John, uh, John Bead bead mix, I'm just gonna pick out one seed bead and you can see it actually doesn't fit on this 20 gauge wire. So I wanna see if I can find one that has a slightly bigger hole and indeed that one worked. So that's a really good lesson as well. Sometimes in the tubes of seed beads or even on the strands of beads, that you will get, not all bead holes are created alike. So sometimes you just kind of have to move one aside and try a different, um, a different bead and then hopefully that will fit through whatever it is that you need to fit through. So quick, quick tutorial, quick um, wrap loop, the way that I like to make my wrap loops, I'm gripping it right over that bead I'm gonna use my thumb to bend it down at about a 40 degree, five degree angle. I'm gonna switch my tool right here and pull this over the top. Then I'm going to switch my grip, bring this around. And I actually like to change my hands. I find it much easier to do my pushing and my pulling with my wire when I am using my dominant hand, my right hand. And then once again, I wanna come in here, snip this off and tuck it in. And so now this just becomes a pendant like any other pendant. And where's my halfway, halfway strung design? I would then string this on here and then continue going up the other side as if I, it was just another bead as part of the pendant. One thing that I do wanna show though, before, before our time is done is how I crimped the end of this necklace because I used a little bit of a different technique um, than you might be used to. And um, if you are reading in the instructions, I just wanted to show really quickly how I did this. So you can see here where that crimp tube is. So I have one seed bead, one crimp tube, one seed bead, my wire guardian, and then my clasp. So I just wanna show really quickly what I did there because I did add a little extra seed bead there. And I think that it just makes that ending of the design flow a little bit more seamlessly into the rest of the design. So just very quickly as we're getting finished up, we're gonna pretend like I have done that whole rest of the necklace and I'm gonna come around and I'm going to add one seed bead. I'm going to add a crimp tube. And this is a size two crimp tube, which of course is the size that corresponds with the size of wire that I'm using. And we always tell you right on the wire package, which size crimp bead and which size crimp tube that you wanna use. And then um, before I go ahead and add my class, I'm going to add another seed bead. I'm going to add my wire guardian. Just one wire guardian. Wire guardians always tend to wanna, wanna hug each other. So you have to un, unhug them. And let's just get this. So up one side of the wire guardian, down the other side. And these wire guardians are great because they help just protect that wire from rubbing against the clasp. So sometimes, oop, that clasp is a little bit too small for the wire guardian. I'm just gonna grab another one from my box O clasp over here. And always, always decisions that need to be made and things that need to be attended to as you are making jewelry. Make sure that your wire guardian is going to fit around your clasp. And one of the things that I always suggest 
when you are working with wire guardians and sometimes um, this does not make it into the instruction sheet is you want to come in here with your chain nose pliers and just very gently squeeze the ends of that wire guardian together okay um, what there are certain times that I won't do that but when I'm crimping I always squeeze the ends of my wire guardian together very, very gently. But again, it's just a little piece of horseshoe shaped metal that provides a little bit of extra protection. And honestly, I just think that they look nice. I really like the way that wire guardians finish off a piece of jewelry. So last but not least, I'm gonna come through here and tighten everything up. So I'm going to thread my wire back through that size eight seed bead back and back through the crimp, okay? And one of the things that you wanna make sure when you are crimping, you wanna try your very best to make sure that the wires are not crossed in that tube. And I am using the standard crimping pliers, of course, and crimping is a three-step process. So first I'm gonna come in here in the very front jaw and I'm going to gently squeeze down and create a, an oval shape. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in the back jaw of those crimping pliers and I'm gonna make a jelly bean. Now I want jelly beans. <laughs> crimping always makes me want jelly beans. And so the last step now is to come here in those front, that front section of those crimping pliers again, and gently come down and around that bead and you can, or that crimp tube. And you can see how I am, I'm moving my crimping pliers around that crimp tube so that it is nice and finished. I'm gonna go with a little tug to make sure it took. What I am not doing, <laughs> I am not coming in and smushing it, okay? Please promise me, everybody put your hand up in a pledge that you are not going to come in and smush the front of that crimping tube in your pliers. All that does is break the wire and ruin your jewelry design. Everything is designed to work together, wire, crimp tube and tool so that if you do that three step process, you should not have to do anything else in order to get that crimp tube um, and that crimp, yeah, in order to, to finish off your jewelry. So then all you would do is thread that wire back through a couple of beads. I like to generally go through like three or four beads. Um, I also generally don't work with that long of a tail, um, but easy enough to come in here, snip that off, and then go ahead and do that very same step on the other side. And the last thing I will say is that you always want to make sure that when you are crimping, you do not tighten this up as as much as humanly possible. You don't wanna to pull to, to pull it up like this and make sure you get all of the all of the, the slack out because what will end up happening is it puts pressure on the wire and the possibility of the wire snapping if you don't build in some nice wiggle room into your necklace design you do not want your wire to snap. So you just wanna make sure that I always, what I do is I kind of come in here and I circle this around and then we're gonna pretend their beads aren't here and I'll circle that around just to double check that if I put it down in my jewelry box, in my jewelry, um, my jewelry box or if there is anything that is putting stress or strain on that necklace, that it's not going to be a problem for our wire. So again, all you would need to do is repeat those steps on the other side, and then you too can have a more amazing necklace. So whew, that was a lot today, and we did go a little bit past our time, but I am going to now try this on and see how it looks. I'm not sure I'm making the, wearing the exact perfect um, outfit for it, but what a fun necklace to wear at the beach 
to um, to wear at a beach party. Um, we, I've been spending a lot of time down the shore. Um, that's how, what that's how we say it when we're in southeastern Pennsylvania. We go down the shore. We don't go to the beach. Um, and so that would be a wonderful necklace to um, to really. Um, not only keep the summer with me during the summer, but during the year as well. So Stephanie from Blue Moon, I hope that I did justice to the wonderful UV resin product that you guys have in Michaels. And I hope that I was able to show how well it works with the beetle on um, stringing wire, but also the beetle on artistic wire to make different shapes that you can then fill in with the resin. So once again, this class will be available within 24 to 48 hours on the Michaels YouTube channel. Thanks Nate for doing a great job behind the scenes moderating. And thanks to Yvette for doing such a great job with the questions and the answers. That's it for me today. Um, keep in mind that um, if you want to please, actually not if you want, please do show um, what, what you've made. I love seeing what people have made from um, the Beetle Antwerp tutorials, from my tutorials, um, and from Sarah's tutorials at two o'clock Eastern time on Wednesdays and sometimes on Saturdays. And when you post them on your socials, use the hashtag Beetalon and also, of course, use the hashtag make it with Michaels because Michaels loves seeing um, the things that people make after taking the classes. So if you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram at Meredith Joy Designs. Um, make sure that you follow the Michaels page and check out all of the classes that the amazing makers um, put up for, for them for free. What a nice thing for Michaels to offer. I hope, they, I hope they never stop. So I will see you all again very, very soon. And until next time, happy beating.